Have you ever thought about Earth itself as an intelligent, well, not creature, but maybe an entity? Like it has a mind and some survival instincts of its own. When said like this, it sounds like you're about to watch a fantasy movie where the planet we walk and live our daily lives on will suddenly wake up, realize it doesn't like us that much after all, and just go crazy. Hope not. But we're not actually talking about such scenarios. More of the idea that the collective activity of life, like microbes and plants, can change a planet and give it a life of its own. It's like the planet has a green mind. The metaphor of Earth as a living planet makes sense. Creatures across the globe crawl, swim, walk, and fly through the uppermost layers of our land, ocean, and sky. Plants cover much of our world. Plus, there are viruses and bacteria in the water, soil, and even atmosphere. Now imagine all the living things on Earth, like plants, animals, and microbes, as a giant team working together. They have different jobs, but they all do their thing to make the planet a better place to live. For example, plants make oxygen that we breathe, and animals help pollinate flowers. Together, they form the biosphere, which is like the Earth's team of life. That's. We're far from that, but it's still nice to imagine. At the moment, our civilization is in the stage scientists named an immature technosphere. That means we're still too focused on using technology that doesn't always do good for our planet. We don't have a planetary intelligence or a collective understanding of what needs to be done to do better for our planet. Instead, we're all just doing our own thing. I mean, we're not at the worst stage. Researchers have come up with four stages of Earth's past and future to explain how planetary intelligence could impact the long-term future of humanity. The first stage is what we call the immature biosphere. It's when life first started on Earth, billions of years ago. Only microbes were there on the bare land without any vegetation. There wasn't any global feedback, which means these microbes couldn't yet affect Earth, its atmosphere, or other systems in any way. The second stage is the mature biosphere, which was 2.5 billion to 540 million years ago, when stable continents formed and the biosphere started to have a strong influence on the Earth. The third stage, known as immature technosphere, is where we are now, with interlinked systems of communication, technology, transportation, electricity, and computers that draw resources from Earth's systems and affect the biosphere. The fourth stage, also known as the mature technosphere, is where Earth should aim to be in the future. It means technology will benefit the entire planet. We'll use sustainable forms of energy, like solar power. Planetary intelligence is the sign of a mature planet, and researchers are trying to figure out how we can move towards it. So things we do on an individual level do matter. The collective activity of life, like microbes or plants, can change a planet and make it more than just a lifeless rock floating in space. 
Through the biosphere, our home planet kind of figured out how to host life by itself billions of years ago, and it's still going. Now we need to figure out how to have a similar kind of self-maintaining system, but this time with the technosphere. It's hard to imagine planets could generally become sentient, like Pandora, or some other imaginary conscious world out there. There are a few reasons for that. First, planets form based on how different materials, like rocks, gases, and liquids gather around a new star. It's like you have a big family gathering, where everyone brings different ingredients to make a delicious dish. And just like how these ingredients won't suddenly turn into a living being, the materials that make up a planet won't just turn into self-aware creatures. On Earth, after billions of years of complex chemical reactions, some molecules started to replicate themselves and carry information. That's how life on our planet began. And Earth is the only such example we have. Here's the second reason. Imagine you have a big garden where you plant a lot of mushrooms or bacteria, hoping they'll become really smart and help you take care of the garden. But mushrooms and bacteria don't have brains like we do. Eh, it's not like they need it anyway. Having a big brain is really expensive for animals too. It takes a lot of energy to keep it running. So animals only become as smart as they need to be to survive and thrive in their environment. Dogs and cats are pretty smart because they need to be able to avoid danger and find food. They don't need human kind of intelligence for things like building houses, creating art, or inventing new technologies. So it would be hard to bring all living beings and plants to the same level of intelligence. The third reason why it would be difficult for a planet to become sentient is the main rule of the animal kingdom. Life is all about survival of the fittest. Every creature is competing for resources, like water, food, and space. But not only do different species compete against each other, but individuals within the same species also fight. Just think of how fiddler crabs fight for territory on the beach, or how wolf packs fight over prey. Or me, when I see an empty spot on a crowded beach. This kind of competition is not a good base for global cooperation. There are a couple of exceptions to this rule. For example, ants. They may not be the brightest creatures on the planet, but when they come together in colonies, they can achieve amazing things, like gathering food that's way bigger than them, building nests, raising young, and even farming. In fact, they act like a super organism called a hive mind, where every ant works together towards a common goal. Insects like bees and ants are very altruistic and work together to ensure their queen reproduces. If one large ant colony took over our whole planet, it could act as a single mind and work towards the colony's and planet's interests until they run out of resources. But in reality, it's hard to imagine any organism, even a superorganism, could reach such a level of self-awareness and consciousness. Number 5. How could we keep in contact? When it comes to communication, ants use pheromones and humans use nerves. Both of these methods work well for small organisms, but when it comes to a giant planet-sized entity, it would be hard to make such communication fast and efficient. So communication within a planet-sized entity would be much slower than what we have in our homes, like our computers or smartphones. Oh well, we'll just continue dreaming about Pandora. Do you know that these days our planet has not one, but several moons? Well, kind of. Astronomers have recently discovered another moon orbiting Earth. But it's not what you might be imagining. It's actually an asteroid trailing along beside our planet in a complex semi-orbit. The asteroid was named 2023 FW13, and instead of simply orbiting our planet like the moon does, it orbits the sun. But its orbit is so unusual that it causes the asteroid to circle Earth too, keeping it in roughly the same area as our planet, even though it doesn't orbit it directly. You've probably already realized that 2023 FW13 isn't the kind of moon where we could send a mission. It's way smaller and farther away than our natural satellite. The newly found space object is a mere 50 feet across and is floating 9 million miles away. And that's when it's the closest to Earth. 
This distance is around 35 times as great as that between our planet and the moon. On the other hand, cosmically speaking, it's just next door. For the first time, the quasi-moon was spotted by astronomers at the Pan-STARRS Observatory on Haleakala in Hawaii in March 2023. Now, a quasi-moon is a space object which shares a similar orbital path with a planet, even though it doesn't orbit this planet directly. Plus, it has a steady relative position to this planet. True moons always keep a relatively consistent distance from their parent planet, but quasi-moons have more complex paths. That's because of the combined gravitational influences of the Sun and the planet itself. Quasi-moons usually have horseshoe or tadpole-like orbits. To put it simply, you can see them travel ahead or behind a planet when it orbits the Sun. Such an orbit is truly unusual, and it occurs because the gravitational pull between the Sun, the planet, and the quasi-moon results in a complex dynamic, leading to a delicate balance in the trajectory of the quasi-moon. When a quasi-moon moves ahead of a planet, it tends to slow down with time, and in the end it falls behind because of the gravitational influence of the planet. Similarly, when a quasi-moon falls behind at first, it later starts speeding up and begins to move ahead of the planet. This is what creates that horseshoe shape if you look at this dance from a fixed point in space. At the same time, the orbit will look like a tadpole from the perspective of the planet. Scientists love quasi-moons because they present great research possibilities. Their interesting orbits make them perfect for studying gravitational influences and the intricacies of space mechanics. Plus, they're usually close to their parent planets, which can also offer insights into the formation and evolution of planetary systems. And who knows, maybe at one point in the future, they'll help us with space exploration. Missions to such quasi-moons could give us important information about different celestial bodies and help with the exploration of the solar system. But let's get back to our tiny moon. While it's still being studied, current data suggests that 2023 FW13 entered its current orbit at least 2,100 years ago. And according to simulations based on preliminary orbital calculations, the quasi-moon will accompany Earth for another 1,700 years or so. The good news is that the asteroid won't end up on a collision course with Earth, despite traveling relatively close to our planet. A few years ago, another asteroid was pulled into Earth's orbit and started to travel along with our planet. No larger than an average car, it was still a big deal. Out of more than 1 million asteroids astronomers know about, it was only the second one to orbit our planet. Called 2020 CD3, it became our temporary mini-moon. It wasn't going to stay with Earth for long, though. The asteroid is following a random orbit and is slowly drifting away. 2020 CD3 will make another close pass to Earth in March 2044, though it will most likely not be caught by Earth again because of the greater approach distance. Temporarily captured objects, such as this one, are rare. They need to have a specific direction and speed to be captured by Earth's gravitational pull. Otherwise, they either crash into the planet or fly in another direction. And in 2016, astronomers discovered another space rock and called it Kamo'oalewa. There was one absolutely amazing thing about this space traveler. Astronomers suspect that this celestial body could have formed after splitting off the moon during an ancient collision with an asteroid. Yes, it means it might be a piece of our moon. When specialists examined the space body and analyzed its composition, the results didn't match any of the more than 2,000 near-Earth asteroids studied before. Kamo'oalewa was too tiny and too far away for regular telescopes to study it. That's why the researchers had to find a more powerful telescope to learn more about this unusual find. After using the Large Binocular Telescope, one of the largest optical telescopes in America, and the Infrared Lowell Discovery Telescope, the scientists finally figured out what the asteroid was made of, and what they had discovered surprised them. The asteroid had light spectra similar to those of the samples of lunar material delivered to Earth by the 1960s and 1970s Apollo missions. Astronomers admit that there might be other asteroids with the same spectra, but so far, they haven't found anything like that. Kamo'oalewa is another quasi-satellite of our planet. 
its orbit is a bit tilted and slightly elongated. So the rock keeps leaping ahead and then falling behind Earth. In other words, it performs constant loops around us. At its closest, the 130-foot-wide asteroid gets to the distance of around 40 times that of the Moon. According to the results of orbital analysis, the rock has been following Earth for at least 100 years. We found more than 480 lunar meteorites on our planet. It may mean that pieces of our natural satellite travel through space pretty regularly. And Kama Oalewa might as well just be the first discovered large rock split off the moon as a result of an ancient collision. Now we've already talked about quasi-moons. Let's find out more about asteroids. These space bodies are often called minor planets or planetoids. They're usually rocky leftovers from the early formation of our solar system that occurred around 4.6 billion years ago. They are mainly found in the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Asteroids can be very different in size, from tiny dust particles and modestly sized boulders to huge bodies reaching 600 miles across. Asteroids often have irregular shapes, especially smaller ones. At the same time, large space bodies can have more of a spherical shape. Unlike planets, asteroids don't consist of layers. They're made of different kinds of metals and rocks and have no atmosphere. Funnily enough, some asteroids have moons of their own, and there are even asteroid binaries where two asteroids of similar size orbit each other. The asteroid belt located between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter has the largest number of asteroids in our solar system. There are millions of space rocks there of various shapes and sizes. But despite such a huge number of asteroids, they're widespread across the vastness of the cosmos. And if you accidentally wandered into that region, the chances of your spacecraft colliding with an asteroid would be quite low. But even though most asteroids prefer to stay in the asteroid belt, some of them make their way closer to Earth. Those are called near-Earth asteroids. Experts monitor such asteroids because of the potential risk they pose. In the past, they did affect our planet. Think of that large one that most likely wiped dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. NASA and other international space agencies have sent a few missions to research asteroids. Some of them aim to retrieve samples from asteroids and return them to Earth for study. Look at this spatula. Just a regular tool. Mix and spread ingredients, right? But wait, this one is floating in space for some reason. So there's this astronaut named Pierce Sellers. There he is. He's up there in space, just doing his thing. When all of a sudden, he accidentally drops his trusty spatula. Let me give you some context. This all happened during the Space Shuttle Discovery's STS-121 flight back in 2006. They were on their way to the ISS on a mission to test out some new safety techniques. And now this spatula is just a tiny drop in the ocean of space debris. Humans have been exploring space for, like, over half a century now. We've left all kinds of random stuff up there, from itty-bitty bolts to entire space stations. We've chucked a ton of things into the great beyond. Most of it burns up in a spectacular blaze as it re-enters Earth's atmosphere. But some bigger pieces can be a real danger for astronauts and their fancy spacecraft. Like, imagine accidentally crashing into a massive hunk of space junk. There are other weird things found in space. In November 2008, astronaut Heidi Stefanischon Piper was out on a spacewalk trying to fix a jammed gear on a solar panel. Suddenly, she lost her grip on the bag. That bag weighed around 30 pounds and was filled with all sorts of cool stuff, like grease devices, a scraper tool, and bags for debris. And it was pretty pricey for a tool bag. It cost around $100,000. Some time later, amateur astronomers spotted the bag floating around in space. If you're in North America, you can even check if the tool bag is passing through your little slice of the sky. Just hop on over to spaceweather.com's satellite tracker and see if you can catch a glimpse of this interstellar tool bag. By the way, if you need to twist some wires in space and you don't have pliers, well, you may stumble upon them as they're free floating in space too. Back in the day, when astronauts were just getting their space groove on, they tended to misplace things up there. During his first spacewalk on the Gemini 4 flight in 1965, Ed White, a famous spacewalker, accidentally let go of his glove. 
That glove decided to have its own adventure and hung out in orbit for a whole month before getting roasted in Earth's atmosphere. So not all debris is there to stay after all. So, space junk is basically all the stuff floating around in space that humans have left behind. Before we got all curious and started exploring, there wasn't any space debris hanging around. Imagine space junk as a little kid who just learned how to walk and play with their own toys. When they couldn't walk yet, it was easy for the person watching them to keep the play area clean. They were in charge of taking out the toys and putting them away. But now that the kids can walk, they can grab as many toys as they want and make a huge mess on the carpet. Well, it's kind of the same with us humans exploring outer space. We've sent all sorts of cool gadgets, like cameras, rovers, and rockets to check out what's out there. But we haven't really thought about bringing them back to Earth. And that's where the problem comes in. All this space junk floating around could mess up outer space and even our planet. When we think about outer space, we often imagine vast open spaces that are yet to be fully explored. Humans have only discovered a tiny 5% of the universe. But here's something they might not always consider. The impact of all the cool gadgets they send out there. Believe it or not, as of May 2022, we've got more than 5,000 satellites orbiting Earth. Over 5,000 opportunities for these machines to go haywire, get lost in space, or even worse, create a bunch of debris that could harm both outer space and our lovely planet. There's at least 3,000 satellites just hanging around up there, not doing anything useful, and nobody seems to be bothered about bringing them back home. And what if one of these inactive satellites accidentally collides with one of the thousands of other space junk pieces orbiting our planet? It will result in a catastrophic disaster. We're talking about a crazy release of toxic substances that could wreak havoc on our poor Earth. Space junk can mess things up for scientists trying to make important discoveries. It's not just floating around aimlessly in space or posing a threat to Earth it can hinder their chances of success. Even the moon has its fair share of junk, which Neil Armstrong definitely didn't encounter when he landed there in 1969. Think of it like this. Imagine you're an artist trying to create a huge painting. It's hard to do that if there's a bunch of old paints, brushes, and other stuff cluttering up your play area, right? Well, it's the same deal for scientists trying to set up camp and use new technologies for advanced missions and space exploration. They need a clean and organized space, just like you need a tidy work area. Otherwise, it's chaos. So here's the deal with space junk. It's not just about sending stuff up into the atmosphere. It's also about how far away we send it. You see, when satellites are sent over 22,000 miles into the atmosphere, it becomes a real problem to retrieve them and bring them back to Earth. And that leads to even more space junk floating around up there. Now, I know what you're thinking. How long will it take for space junk to become a major problem? Well, it might still be a few more years before it messes things up in outer space. But hey. That doesn't mean it's not a threat to satellites we have up there right now. Those poor guys are at risk of getting damaged, destroyed, or even leaking toxic stuff because of all that junk. So, space debris isn't just a problem for space exploration, but it's also a problem for us Earthlings, even though it's floating thousands of miles above us. Space junk is like that annoying neighbor who throws trash out their window and it ends up in your backyard. Except, instead of trash, it's releasing all sorts of chemicals into our atmosphere that are slowly destroying our precious ozone layer. It can even ruin future space missions. Imagine this, you're all pumped up to launch a rocket into space, but nope, space junk decides to crash the party. Not only does it mess up the launch, but it also adds more pollution to our already struggling atmosphere. And if things couldn't get worse, imagine a shooting star or meteor accidentally smacking into some space junk on its way to Earth. Boom! Millions of toxic particles raining down on us, further depleting the ozone layer. 
Plus, space debris is becoming a real problem for space missions. In 2022, we found some space debris hanging out on Mars. The Perseverance rover stumbled upon its own back shell just chilling on the surface of Jezero Crater. They also spotted a random piece of a thermal blanket that might have come from the rover's descent stage. Also, human-made space debris actually smacked into the moon in 2022. It was probably some old rocket body from the 2014 Chang'e 5 T1 mission, but nobody saw that coming. It left a double crater behind. The more space junk we have floating around in low Earth orbit, the higher the chances of a cosmic collision. These collisions are no joke. They've already caused some serious satellite damage. Even the ISS has to constantly maneuver to dodge space debris. But scientists seem to know how to clean up this orbital mess. They're planning to send space vehicles armed with nets, harpoons, and even robotic arms to capture and de-orbit all that junk.